Welcome to the Rock Coding YouTube channel. My name is Anton and today is going to be a different type of video. We're going to be talking about work related issues a developer faces. Basically a question one of my patrons has asked and people on my discord server has been has been have been interested in it. So here I am making this video. What are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about annoying colleagues, uh, colleagues, annoying managers, uh, pressures to deliver, deadlines, uh, putting a low quality code into production, bad and right, all of that work related problems and how do you resolve them? So before we get in, I have two books uh, to recommend to you. The first one is by Uncle Bob. I can't put it. It's basically the clean coder. So how Uncle Bob has a book on the clean code. He has the clean coder, which is basically about how a software engineer should behave professionally or a programmer should behave professionally in a professional environment. Okay. And some of the stuff that I'm going to be telling you today, I'm just going to be paraphrasing from that book or the second book, Extreme Ownership by Choco, Choco, Choco. He's not a Cocoa Puff, right? Uh, it's Jocko Willink. So ex-Marine, and uh, if you don't know who he is, he gives out a lot of a good advice on uh, leadership. So some of the stuff that I'm going to be telling you today are going to be his words. Before I answer all of these questions individually, I want to say that these questions will generally only arise if you're working for a company of a certain type, a company which is not fostering Kaizen. Kaizen, Japanese word, which stands for continuous improvement. If you cannot look at your environment and say, that's fucked up, that's not right, we need to fix this, and then the company itself is not helping you remove whatever roadblocks you have for you to do your work, because you are the workforce, you're producing value. If you cannot produce value and the company is not helping you, that's a dead end. Furthermore, if the company is pissing you off and <laughs> makes you not want to produce value, that is even worse, right? So a company which fosters a culture of continuous improvement where you can say that is wrong, we're going to change it, or I have this problem, can you help me? The higher management goes ahead and removes that roadblock for you. In those types of companies, your real day-to-day -day problems are just problems that need solving, not problems that are like, oh, why is my manager such a dickhead? Question number one, pressure to deliver. You've been working on a piece of software. Somebody is telling you we need to have it earlier, do work faster. Programming is thinking you cannot think faster. You can take overtime, but that's essentially debt that you will have to repay at some point. What do you do in this situation when you're being told, can you work faster? Well, you are the professional. You need to tell them how long it's going to take and how it is going to happen. You don't go to the doctor saying, I want my operation on the leg to be performed twice as fast. I don't have three hours to sit in an operating room or something like that. You just don't say that. You go to the doctor, he gives you the verdict, you accept it, okay? Now, you can be in a reasonable situation where they say, listen, we need this, but faster. And then you say, okay, I can deliver to you this faster if we cut the scope in half and we remove some of the features. Go ahead and decide what features can you remove. There's also another side to the coin here where you as a developer, you think I need to make it scalable in every single direction. So I need to account for all of these unknowns. So I need to place interface as abstractions and ABC, all of these places, and I need to properly design it. Sometimes you don't need to do all of that work. Sometimes you literally just need to do what you're being asked for and not cover every single scenario in the future. The balance for this really comes from experience and you being able to ask the product owner or whoever knows the business best the correct questions and then you can make an educated decision. Situation number two, sometimes what you can find yourself in is that you cannot get help on a problem. You're working on some kind of problem, you need help. The only person that can help you is that engineer that is sitting in some kind of ivory tower. He has uh, like five minutes to spare. You cannot get him on Slack anywhere. Everybody needs his help, right? What you do in this situation is you say, I'm roadblocked. You say that to your management. The management says, okay, you're roadblocked. Is your feature that you're working on that important? No, go help other people. Drop the work, wait till you have time and until the feature becomes important. If the feature or the work that you're doing is really that important, 
the upper management will get you time with that senior engineer and he should be able to help you resolve the problem. Now, specifically in the question, the senior engineer is a little bit of a unpleasant person, let's say. And when you ask him for help, he's like, why haven't you done it yet? Why don't you know how to do it? It's easy. All of the answers are in front of you. So basically, instead of helping you, he's uh, asking you, why are you stupid? I've personally never been in that situation myself. What I would have done is I would have asked somebody to come with me into that meeting. So we're both or three of us are asking that same question. So now it's more of a group scenario where yeah, uh, this topic is actually not well understood and you need to explain it to us properly. It's not just me who is stupid. All of us are stupid here. You're going to have to help us out. Okay. Topic number three is going to be direct confrontation, something that I am personally guilty of. Your colleague is doing something wrong, pushing bugs into production, writing code, not the way that you want to write it. Their way of writing code is bad. Yours is good. They've touched things that they shouldn't have touched. They're not following the process and you, an individual of sheer knowledge goes over there and asks, why are you doing this stupid shit? And expecting a reaction of, oh yeah, I haven't noticed. Thank you. I am going to correct my behavior. Uh, that's not what you say. You say, well, don't tell me how to live my life, bro. And that is what you're doing. You're essentially telling the person how he or she should behave and you can call that backseat driving. Nobody likes being told what to do. And this is something that Jocko Willink uh, explains at length on his pod podcast. Uh, he talks a lot about this is rather than taking the direct approach, you take the indirect approach. With some people, you cannot be direct and it will be taken as a personal offense. And what you should be doing at that point is then taking an indirect approach. Let's say your colleague is pushing bugs into production rather than saying you have introduced a bug into the system. Why have you done it? You basically say I've been told to investigate a bug. Here is some code that you have written. Can you tell me why you have written this code? Because you don't know why they have written it. So you rediscover the bug together and then you ask the colleague to essentially fix it and try to poke and nudge and maybe suggest some kind of solution and hopefully re-arrive at the same solution that you would have put in place. With this approach, the colleague, which is the repeating offender, will hopefully spend so much time with you that eventually we'll just be able to think about the problems the same as you do and essentially solve them in the same way, dissolving the problem of introducing bugs or not following process. Number four, suggesting change. The situation here is that let's say your company has been using .NET Framework for forever and you've heard about this thing, .NET Core, you're using it, easy to upgrade to the latest version, your software gets faster for free. Why are we still using .NET Framework? And then your old boss is like, you know, a suit, uh, overly large pants is like, man, uh, .NET Core is not production ready. The less extreme version of this would be your team doing same old stuff and you're like, eh, maybe we should use this thing over here. And your team is like, what, TypeScript? What's this? Uh, no, 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 get this thing out of here. None of that nonsense. We're going to be using JavaScript over here, all right? What do you do in this situation? How can you provoke that change? Well, you need, you know, in either monetary value or you need some kind of value needs and it needs to be visible. You need to show it. And just like the projects that you work on, that you need time to actually realize all of them, it's going to take time in order to realize the full value of the change. And some people just don't have the time to migrate their code base from .NET Framework to .NET Core, upscale people, all of that stuff. They just don't see the benefit of it. What you're going to have to do is to really show the potential for the value by introducing little value and you can introduce little value in little time. So that is what you do. You steer the ship one little inch at a time. This advice comes from Udi Dahan and it goes something like this. Look, I am on board with what we're currently doing. .NET framework. Love it. Tried, true, stable. We can't go wrong with it. However, here is this benefit that we're not realizing. If you give me half a day, I can show you that by transferring this module or this app to this, we can save 
10,000 a month or something like that. Half a day or a day for a change like that looks pretty good. So once you have the data by the end of it presented, sell your idea. If you got your half a day, maybe then you can say, uh, give me two more days and you can have all of that further value. And slowly but surely, you're going to show them the full potential of this change and maybe they will come on your board. But remember, you cannot be an outsider to the tribe. If you're all the .NET framework tribe, you're saying, yeah, I'm in this tribe as well. I like what we're doing, but potentially we can start doing that and you have to evolve slowly with the whole tribe. Number five, the last point that I want to talk about is essentially a dead end. You've tried everything. You keep meeting the same roadblocks. You communicate them to your management. They are not doing anything about them. The colleagues don't want to communicate. No work is being done. You don't feel productive. You feel bad about the work that you're doing. Unfortunately, these things can happen. The best thing that you can do in this situation is, again, just put your head down, learn as much as you can, and look for a new opportunity. Fortunately, you're a software engineer. They are needed all over the world. As long as you're willing to invest the time into your skills and become an above average developer, there is a place for you anywhere in the world. And there we have it. That concludes the video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. If you have any further questions or you want to share some of your stories, please leave them in the comment. And you know, if I have some advice for you, I will share it with you. If you enjoy my work and would like to support it, please do so on Patreon. A very big and special thank you goes out to all of my current Patreon supporters. You help me make these videos. As always, thank you for watching. Have a good day.